The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on the IMI2 Corn 9 topic on the identification and validation of non-invasive markers across the spectrum of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. My name is Catherine Brett, and I'm going to start today by giving you a little introduction into how to use the GOTO webinar. And then my colleague, Magda Gunn, who's the scientific officer responsible for this topic at IMI, is going to give you a little introduction to the call and some advice on how to put together a good proposal. After that, uh, Julia Brosnan from Pfizer and David E. Kelly of Merck will present the call topic, and at the end, there'll be time for questions and answers. So, how to use GoToWebinar? It's very simple. In the top right-hand corner of your screen, you should be able to see this control panel. You can expand and minimize it. You can go full screen, and you can attract our attention by raising your hand. On the audio front, you have two options. The simplest for most of you will be to listen over your computer speakers. Um, to do that, just select the mic and speakers option in your audio panel. If you have any problems, you should check if your speakers are switched on and not muted, and do a sound check to make sure that GoToWebinar is actually picking up the right speakers. The other option is, of course, to use your telephone. Here, you just select telephone in the audio panel and dial the numbers given. If you want a number other than the one that comes up automatically, just click on the additional numbers link. And again, if you have any problems, you can try another number, or you can try listening over your computer speakers. For most of you, the most important thing will probably be asking questions. And here you have two options. The simplest is to send your question in in writing. Just type your question into the questions panel and click on send. If you want to ask a question over the phone, then rate, click on the raise hand icon, and we'll come to you. Before we get started, just a note to tell you that IMI 2 Call 9 hasn't been launched yet. We do expect to be able to launch it in the very near future, but in the meantime, all information on the call is indicative and subject to change pending IMI Governing Board approval. Um, as soon as we have that approval, we will publish all of the information on the call on the IMI website, and I really would encourage you to go and read it. Um, especially because some of the forms have actually changed this call compared to last, the previous calls. Um, we are recording this webinar and we will publish it and the slides on the IMI website on the page where you signed up for the webinar. And we'll also be circulating a participant list so that you can find other people who are interested in this topic. So on that note, I will hand over to Magda. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, Today's webinar will cover uh, all of the aspects of the call topic. Uh, so uh, Julia will tell you about the objectives of the project, why do we need the public-private collaboration, what will be the suggested structure of the project, and also the expected contributions from the applicants. Uh, she will speak a little bit about what the FTA partners, so the industrial partners, can contribute to the project and what uh, will be the key deliverables. Uh, during this webinar, we will not cover the rules and procedures. Uh, this webinar happened yesterday, in fact, but if you are interested, the recording and the presentations are available on our website. So it would be a good idea to have a look to be acquainted with our rules. In terms of tips uh, about uh, submitting your proposals, of course, read all the relevant material on our website. Not only the call topic text, but also all the accompanying uh, documentation where you can find the rules for participation, you can find the relevant templates, uh, the new template for the short proposal, the new evaluation template, so you know exactly which criteria will be used to evaluate your proposal. Uh, you can contact our office if you have any questions, either regarding the rules or regarding the call topic text itself. Do not contact the FPA topic coordinators. They are, in fact, uh, not allowed to provide you any feedback to uh, ensure the fair treatment for all the potential applicants. So please always communicate through IMI office. Uh, it's, what's important is to provide all the relevant information in your proposal. So the reviewers have all the things that they need to evaluate it. They will be evaluating your proposal as is, as it's written. So make sure that to, to include everything you think is important. Of course, start working early. We have published uh, draft call topic texts already a while ago to uh, make sure that people have enough time to network, to find partners, and to start preparing the proposal. 
and also finalize and submit your proposal. In our SOFIA system, you have to actually click twice. After you finalize, you have to submit in order for us to receive your proposal. There's many more tips available on our website, so please also have a look. In terms of common mistakes that we have seen over the past years, sometimes the admissibility or eligibility criteria are not met. It happens quite often, unfortunately, that people miss deadlines because they start working too late and uh, leave it to the last minute and something goes wrong. So it's always a good idea to start um, well before the deadline. If the proposal is out of scope, of course, it will not be considered. So make sure that you submit it to the right topic. Um, you need to respect the proposal template and make sure to include all the relevant sections of the proposal. Um, minimum number of legal entities need to be um, also respected. So there need to be three legal entities from three different uh, countries, European or associated countries. To increase your chances of success, uh, some of the things you can do, of course, make sure there is no redundancy between different partners, that all the relevant expertise is included uh, in the consortium, that all ob objectives are addressed, um, and then also so focus on the impact of the proposal and describe what the, the if the project is realized, what will it bring. Um, not only scientific excellence is important, but also what will be the, the ultimate outcome of the project. In terms of partnerships, uh, looking for partners, there are many um, platforms where this can be facilitated. Of course, the best is to network with your contacts, with your uh, collaborators, uh, with fellow webinar participants, of course, uh, and the list will be circulated. You can use our partner search tool. Uh, you can find the link here as, as well as on our website. And there are also several others, uh, other search tools, uh, partner search tools, for example, Fit for Health. Um, national contact points or SRG members can be also of some assistance. And don't forget about social media. It could be also a useful tool. And I think that in, that's it from me. So I'll hand over to uh, Julia and uh, David. They will give you the, the topic rel related presentation. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Magda and, and Catherine. And good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to present this call topic on, this, on behalf of myself, Julia Brosnan from Pfizer and David Kelly from Merck, who are the call leaders. There are a number of other FDA companies involved in the, in, this prepar in the preparation of this call, and they're actually listed at, at the end of the group. The call is coming out of the Diabetes and Metabolic Disorders Group, a, a strategic governing group of IMI. And the title, as we've already heard, is Identific and Valid Identification and Validation of Non-Invasive Biomarkers Across the Spectrum of Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease. Can I get the next slide, please? So the challenge, as we all, as we all on this call will be aware, is that NASH is a very serious liver disease. It's at the end of the NAFL spectrum, but it, it's, the, it's the part which is called causing a health crisis. We know NASH can progress to cirrhosis with the attendant comorbid with the attendant morbidities, and it also causes this heightened risk of HCC. Right now, there's a lot of activity going on in, in the drug development space of NASH, but it's being hindered as we don't have the non-invasive biomarkers we need to diagnose and classify those subjects so that the right subjects are getting the right treatment. We particularly need to identify those who have NASH and those who are going to get NASH. So the whole um, central challenge of this call is to identify and validate those biomarkers that can be used to track disease progression, they can track responses to inter intervention, and they can have a um, huge impact on, on advancing clinical care and drug development for NASH. And they're also going to help us break down what's clearly a very heterogeneous, a heterogeneous disease with heterogeneous outcomes. Can I get the next slide, please? So, so what's the current state right now? Well, I think we're all aware that NAFL, the, um, the prevalence is rising. It's closely linked to, to the epidemics of obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. We know that the estimated worldwide, worldwide prevalence is approximately 30%, and we also know this doubles within a type 2 diabetic population. 
We also know that these numbers are somewhat estimates because it's hidden. In the absence of biopsy, we really can't diagnose where any individual sits within the NAPL spectrum, if at all. We also are very aware that many individuals will have theatosis, but they'll never develop to the NASH, and they'll never develop the fibrosis and the inflammatory pathways that are part of NASH. And it's imperative that we can begin to dissect who are those subjects that we need and want to be treating. As I've already said, the diagnosis of NASH, its staging, and its distinction from NAFLS is presently based on histological assessment of a liver biopsy, which has its risks, it's painful, it's invasive, and, and it's only, um, only certain subjects are actually biopsies. So there's very clear consensus that a, that a lack of diagnostic, prognostic, and treatment response, uh, <laughs> treatment response biomarkers are hampering clinical practice and seriously slowing down drug development at this stage. Next slide, please. So, so it, it, it's a big problem. And people have tried to look at this in the past. And this is maybe part of the problem, is that there are numerous small studies where biomarkers have been looked at within a small population, but the results have rarely been replicated and they've rarely been looked at by other investigators. We are all, I think, very well aware that there are num a large number of cancer biomarkers out there. It's not that there has been no effort going on. The studies are small, not very few, if any, have been validated against liver biopsies. They've not been studied systematically. There have been few sufficiently powered investigations to give us confidence in these biomarkers. Um, there has been no serious collation of relevant existing clinical research in this space. And the feeling very, very much is if we were to bring together all of the biomarker data as it stands right now, there would probably would be some emerging, some emerging candidates that would be strong to go forward. The problem is also increased by the fact there is a need for, for the liver biopsy to understand the disease. As we've already said, this is currently the basis for diagnosing it diagnosis and staging, but it hasn't been looked at in combination with the candidate biomarkers. The liver biopsy is also the basis for adjudicating the effectiveness of intervention, but to look at biomarkers with, that, with um, a liver biopsy has been challenging because of the risks and the costs associated with liver biopsy. And currently, on-treatment liver biopsy is required for registration of novel treatments. So there's been two arms to this problem. There's been the candidate biomarkers that are being investigated, and there's the need for the liver biopsy. And really, to bring this whole field forward, we need to design and develop a study in which these two arms are brought, to, brought forward together in a large enough, powered enough study to be able to actually learn, learn something new. And that, of course, is very, very expensive. There are numerous players in this space that need to be brought together. And so what we're hoping to bring here now is, is a game-changing call in which we do bring together the many different facets of the team that are, that are required so we can validate the non-invasive -bi non biomarkers against the liver biopsy in an appropriately designed, sufficiently powered study so that we can actually bridge these contemporary standards for the clinical practice and the drug development. Can I get the next slide, please? So, so what is the purpose of this IMI2 initiative? Well, as I said, we are bringing together a level of funding and the multi-stakeholder commitment sufficient to definitively address the biomarker challenge in that, its challenges in NAFLD and NASH. We're not saying that this hasn't been tried before. We're all aware that there is a lot of existing NAFLD and NASH research data and research cohorts, and we're well aware that samples have been retained and, and, bi and candidate biomarkers have been measured but we want to bring them together here with the, um, including the properly adjudicated liver biopsies. We intend within this call to employ standardized laboratory an analysis. There is a, a large bioinformatics component expected. We expect to harmonize the biomarker data so that we can collate it and interrogate it more effectively. And as I've indicated, we do expect, given, given the budget that's going to be associated with the project and the number of pharmaceutical companies and research partners here, that this is going to be a transformative project. And it has to be transformative to get consensus acceptance by the community. 
by the basic and clinical in investigators. We need to be confident that the biomarkers we're proposing um, are, are valid. We need to be confident as these will be decision markers, decision making biomarkers by drug development and ultimately, but not within the time limit of this particular call, we expect these to lead to regulatory approval. Next slide. So, so there's many different kinds of bi biomarkers and we don't want to um, indicate that we're trying to measure every single one. We are looking for diagnostic biomarkers so that when we know, when we know or suspect somebody's on the NAFLD spectrum, we can know whether they're, they're simply steatotic, whether they are fibrotic, what the level of inflammation is, and, and where within NASH we actually are. So we call these the diagnostic, and as I've indicated, specifically in this space, we're looking to identify the severity or stage of hepatic fibrosis. We also want to know the severity of, of the inflammation. Of course, for clinical trials, we need to know our we need to know how to enrich our trials for those that are going to have events. In this case, the event could be the development of NASH or the severity of the NASH that a subject has. And, and clearly, while cross-sectional data can be employed to get to the diagnostic biomarkers, we need um, subject-level data in longitudinal studies for, for the qualification of the predictive biomarkers. And here, we're looking for biomarkers that are going to predict progression along the NAFL spectrum, in particular from NAFL to NASH, and within NASH itself, the progression against the stages of disease severity. Next slide. So I've mainly been talking about the clinical aspects of biomarkers here. The pharmaceutical companies are anxious that the preclinical work is brought forward as part of this call. We believe that the preclinical work and the clinical biomarkers go hand in hand. So we do expect a significant component of the work to be on preclinical model development and qualification. In particular, we want to know whether the, the biomarkers that we're investigating actually um, back translate to the preclinical models. We believe that these models will increase un will help us to increase understanding when they're properly developed of the disease mechanisms. And we also expect uh, these preclinical pre models to have some element of diabetes in the, in, in the development. We're also looking um, to consider non-rodent non models of NASH, um, in particular those that incorporate a context of the metabolic syndrome. And one of the partners in research um, on, on this call is, is um, contributing an element of mini pigs to, to, the, to the program. Um, given the, the role of imaging in the NAFL NASH space, we expect the imaging modalities to apply, be applied to these, these models um, as well. So from the preclinical side, the anticipated deliverable is to establish consensus recommendations of the, the animal models that are the best to use and support of development of novel therapeutics for NAFL and NASH. Next slide. So going back to the clinical study. We are looking for the applicant consortium to bring, to bring together cohorts of subjects. We split it into two different phases, which we call stage 1A and stage 1B. Stage 1A is the validation of a priori hypotheses. As I've already indicated, we know there's a lot of data out there, but we don't believe it's been collated, and we think we now have the opportunity to do this. Within stage 1A, which we um, ex expect to be interrogation of data from um, a cohort which we expect to have over 1,500 subjects in it, we will be looking to identify the top biomarkers from existing data. We're going to qualify by pooling these available data sets, and we're going to contact standardized assay on retained samples as needed. There's going to be a common data repository so that the data can, can be appropriately interrogated. In stage B, which we expect to start at a later stage than 1A, this is going to be, um, it is going to establish a prospective global NAFLD cohort across the full spectrum of disease. These are subjects in whom there's already some period of longitudinal data being collected a minimum of probably three years, and they need to be biopsy certified as to where they are on the spectrum at, at the start of the study. 
these subjects are going to be followed for a period of our, the rest of the study, probably another three years, in which there'll be detailed phenotyping, additional histology, biomarker collection, biomarker samples collected, and imaging. We are expecting um, that the stage 1B is going to extend existing studies that are going on so that it's not going to be just three years follow-up of these studies. It's going to be follow-up to what's already been done so we capture more, more events. Uh, and the overall aim in the stage 1B is to confirm those identified by top, top candidates in the prospective study. Next slide. So I've started to give some clues about what we're expecting the applicant consortium to look like. We're expecting it's going to be led by scientists and physician scientists who are recognized experts in liver disease and specifically in NAFLD and NASH. We're expecting the cohort to encompass subjects within the full spectrum of NAFLD and we also need to be sure that the appropriate informed consents are in place for them to be used in this endeavor. The cohorts selected for stage 1A and subsequently stage 1B should be um, allowable for longitudinal research efforts with quality follow-up procedures. Uh, and we need to know that these cohorts have got a high level of participant retention so that we're going to get to the events that we need. Liver biopsy data must be available. Um, and, and we um, clearly, because only a small number of the subjects within the NAFL spectrum get to the NASH stage, we are expecting to enrich the cohort. I have the cohort enriched so that we're going to get sufficient numbers at the right end side of the spectrum, i.e. those with NASH, so we can do the biomarker qualification. The size, as I've already indicated, for, for, one, for 1A is probably of the order of 1,500 subjects. And moving to 1B, we're expecting to go up to 2,500 subjects. Can I get the next slide? So of course we need the clinical data, including imaging data, to be available on the subjects. We also need to be able to access the data that excludes causes of liver disease other than NAFLD and NASH. Obviously the biomarker data needs to be made available as to the biospecimens that have been collected. And we are also, as I said, expecting to be able to take another biopsy in, in these subjects and that should be at least a period of two years from the initial biopsy. The number of liver biopsies um, may, may in fact be more than two, but depending on when the subjects are introduced into the cohort. Can I get the next slide? So, so what do we expect to get out of it? Well, uh, number one on the list is those baseline characteristics of biomarkers of patients with NAFLD that will allow us to diagnose NASH and better predict disease progression across the spectrum. We um, expect to validate non-invasive biomarkers for clinical trial inclusion. And we're also ultimately looking for the identification of candidate, my, candidate biomarkers that will ultimately serve as surrogate markers for clinical outcomes of NASH. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Yep, sorry, we just uh, lost the uh, presentation. One second. I'll come to it. Maybe if you could uh, just uh, start talking on it to it, and then uh, we'll come to it. Okay, I think so. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, so here, here we. Oh, can you go back? Is this the one expected in practice? is the one. So the, the okay, expected sorry about that. Um, so as I've strongly said, we, we want this to be a game-changing call. We have a, a, a significant number of pharmaceutical companies and research partners involved here. And we need it to be transformative for clinical management patients and profoundly enable drug development in what's becoming a very, very serious disease. Um, we truly believe that the unmet need that is present right now cannot be effectively be addressed without better development of validated biomarkers. Next slide. So we've put together a suggested architecture of the full proposal. 
previous experience has um, at least suggested to some of us that when we have work packages, they're very often most effective when there is an academic lead and a pharmaceutical lead drive, driving these projects. That, of course, isn't driven in stone, but, it, but it's worth considering at this stage. Uh, and as I said, this is the suggest, suggested architecture of the full proposal, with work package one being overall project coordination, integration, and dissemination. Work package two, which relates largely to stage 1A, is the management and integration of existing databases with key focus upon identification of, em of emergent biomarkers. Work package three would be around central laboratory assay development and implementation. Work package four is moving more into the stage 1B part of the project, which will be the clinical replication and validation of, of the biomarkers. We expect this to have um, some element of patient reported outcomes to be involved here. Work package five is around imaging, imaging modalities for an apple and in particular NASH within the context of relationship to liver biopsy data and soluble biomarker data. We also expect this to have other ancillary data, including genetic information here. Work package six is, is, the, is the program that's going to be the development and qualification of relevant preclinical models, rodent and non-rodent, for Anaphold and NASH. Next slide, please. So the indicative duration of this project is, is for five years. At the end of this period, and only if there is sufficient new information collectively deemed of value, do we expect there would be enough justification to extend the study beyond year five with a restricted call. And this focus on this, which we call stage two, would be the, the um, delivering and validating the surrogate markers such that they're ready for regulatory acceptance. Previous experience has taught us that five years is simply not realistic to get to the regulatory acceptance stage. Next slide. I believe this is the final slide I'm going to talk about. So here are the, the companies on the left-hand side, the pharmaceutical companies that are funding and expect to be active participants in this project. Merck, Pfizer, Lilly, Boring, Engelheim, Novo Nordisk, Sanofi, and Novartis. And I really hope I haven't left anybody off. And our partners in research who are also funding and active participants are Somologics and Elagard. One final note, I haven't said it. Um, we do expect this to be a global cohort. We're all very, very well aware of, of emerging genetic data and ethnicity data that's informing us of, of NAFLD, NASH um, genetics and, and prevalence. So, so we do want to stress that we, we are expecting um, a multi-ethnic interrogation to be ultimately put in place. And I'll stop there and, and we can maybe progress to the questions. A, do you want to speak to these no, slides? Yeah, sorry, I've forgotten about my deliverables. Okay, so going back to the, going back to the deliverables. Um, so the key deliverable for stage 1A is to identify and qualify diagnostic biomarkers for, for across the spectrum of NAFLD and in particular NASH. Um, we, uh, as I've already indicated, we need to be, get access to samples and existing biomarker data from existing co cohorts. We do um, intend to perform centralized assays on plasma and stored serum samples on liver biopsies. And as I've already indicated, we are interested in the genetics that are driving risk here. Uh, we strongly believe that bioinformatics and biostatistics support is it, critical to, to driving the biomarker qualification. And, and everything in 1A ultimately leads to what's going to be investigated as biomarkers in, in the separate cohort in stage 1B. So there are two key deliverables for stage 1B, obviously to provide validation of, of 1A prospectively um, and to collect and extend longitudinal clinical data so that we, we can interrogate prediction biomarkers. Um, we're not going to move to stage 1A to stage 1B if stage 1A has not been cons considered successful. So commencement of accruing the validation cohort is completely contingent about making meaningful progress in stage 1A. Oh, and there is the ethnic statement that I was missing. So the validation cohorts are expected to have broad ethnic and demographic diversity. And can you go to the next slide? And um, 
Obviously, there are questions that we can answer scientifically, and there will be questions that need to go to IMI. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. So there on the slide, you can see our email address, infodesk at imi.europa.eu. So if you have any questions after today's webinar um, about the core topic of our rules and procedures, that is where you should send them. Um, so it is now time for questions and answers. You have two options. One is to type your question into the questions panel and click send. And the other is to ask your question over the phone. And for that, you can click on the raise hand icon. And I can see some people have done that already. However, I'm going to start with some questions that came in over email. Um, and one which has come in from a couple of people uh, relates to the issue of the involvement of non-EU sites, for example, in the US and Asia. And maybe, Julia, you'd like to talk a little bit about the scientific aspect, and then Magda will clarify what is in our rules uh, regarding the funding of participants from outside Europe. So, so I, I'll start to answer the question from the scientific perspective. I think everyone um, on this call is aware that we're learning that some ethnicities have a higher um, prevalence of, of um, alleles in certain genes that are influencing the progression of, of nasal NASH. We expect um, data from those ethnicities to be available within within the um, cohort. There are cases we can imagine where they could actually be identified with, within within Europe, for example. However, if they're not available from within your EU sites and they are only available outside of, of the EU, we would consider that those ethnicities are critical to being able to get to the best biomarker identification. Okay, so I will complement the answer to this question in terms of what, what our rules allow. And an IMI uh, participation of uh, non-EU countries is, of course, allowed. However, in terms of eligibility of, for funding, normally those uh, participants from outside Europe are not eligible for IMI funding. However, there could be exceptions. Uh, for um, participation which is deemed essential. So that means that in the proposal, uh, such participants from outside Europe, their value and their essentiality to the, to the project will have to be demonstrated. And then this uh, will be assessed during the evaluation of the proposals by the independent experts. So as Julia explained, of course, from the point of the science, it, it seems very important. So as long as it is well justified, it might be that exceptionally those uh, participants could be uh, deemed eligible for funding. Okay, thank you. Um, and I see there's another question as well about South American countries, and the same would apply um, to that as well. Um, and again, really, I would read very closely the documentation that will be published when we launch the call, because this will have detailed information on all of this. Um, so another question that's come in on the email from Detlef Schuppen. Um, besides cohorts of patients with fatty liver disease, disease within EPOS, um, can or should we include larger cohorts of patients with chronic hepatitis B and C from clinical studies with highly effective antiviral therapies for biomarker validation? Okay, I, I'll, I'll start to answer this question and, and David can step in if he's got anything additional to add. We're very cognizant that doing the study is expensive and the procedures that we need to do, including liver biopsy and imaging modality, are, are going, to, going to be very expensive. We're also aware, as I've already indicated, that the number of subjects that get to the later stages, the, the clinical outcome stages, are, are going to be small and we're absolutely um, committed to, to being able to power the, the identification and validation in the NAFLD NASH space. So our expectation is that the vast majority of the subjects would be those within NAFLD NASH and not within hepatitis. We do agree that we, we can learn from the success stories in, in hepatitis, and, and so we're not completely antagonistic to a small number of subjects in that space, but really to be able to maintain the power for the NAFLD NASH questions that we have, that the strong preference is for those, the, those to be the subjects that are included. Um, David, do you have anything to add to that? No, not not really. I, I, I think that that's quite accurate. The, the purpose here is very pragmatic around identifying qualifying biomarkers for NAFLD and 
and, and NASH and to the extent precedent data in viral uh, hepatitis and, and resolution of, of that informs candidates for NAFLD and NASH, that's fine. But as a as a digression away from NAFLD and NASH, uh, that, that wouldn't be considered, you know, responsive to the call topic. Thank you. And another question. Um, we have collaborations with pharma companies. Some of these are sponsors of IMI. Can or should they be included as cooperation partners? I think this is maybe one for Magda to just briefly explain how IMI calls for proposals work. So it's, this question is a bit unclear, but um, assuming that uh, the, the person asking is, uh, is uh, talking about uh, collaborating with pharma companies during the preparation of the short proposal, this is uh, something that normally shouldn't happen. So uh, typically the pharma companies who are interested in the topic, they come together and they put the topic together, which is then launched by IMI, and then they are removed from the process uh, while we collect the applications from the beneficiaries uh, for funding. So to put together your consortium, you should be looking for uh, universities, SMEs, hospitals, and so on, pharma companies join at the second stage, and these are the, the companies listed uh, here on one of the slides. Now, if you, if you are talking about a pharma company which is not part of the, the, the list, uh, original partners who, who put the topic together, then um, it, it could be up for discussion if this company is to join the consortium, at the later stage, or is it some, some company who would like to collaborate once the project is actually materialized? But this then would be up to the consortium to decide, the final consortium to decide whether or not additional partners would be uh, a good idea to, to, for, for the consortium to, to accept. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions also from Stefan Neubauer over email. Um, what technology readiness level is expected for the diagnostics to be evaluated? And what is the technology readiness level that's aimed for at the end of the project, e.g. regulatory clearance, guideline uptake, or prospective randomized validation? Okay, so, so I'll, I'll start to answer this question. Th this call is not um, primarily about technology development. So with the biomarker space, we, we expect the technology, and I'm here talking about soluble biomarker platforms, we expect the platforms to, to, be, to be running now and able to start largely collecting data now. And, and so that, that is my, my leaning on the, the soluble biomarkers. I think that perhaps some of the imaging biomarker technology, the imaging technology may be in a different space. We're not proposing new technology development, but we're well aware that there are emerging technologies which, which are apparently work, working well, which are not completely developed. Um, we would not be completely antagonistic to those being included. On the other hand, we would want to be absolutely confident that they were fit for purpose and, and gathering and gathering and have gathered useful information by the end of this call. Thank you. And one last question from Stefan. Uh, are you, do you prefer an encompassing broader approach or a targeted lean approach? Um, so, so from this call, it is, is very, very straightforward. We're well aware that there are natural history studies going on right now that are, are doing um, the job of, of the broad approach. This is much more of a focused lean, lean approach, and it's deliberately that being designed that way. We believe it will complement what we expect to be emerging data from some of the natural history cohorts, but, but this is, is entirely focused on the identification and validation of the biomarkers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marcelo Costa has a question. Will you have a universal informed consent form available for participants? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I, I, we can't possibly have one for those cohorts who are providing data in, into stage 1A um, because, because that's what they're already existing cohorts. I, I, I'm not sure I can answer stage, stage 4, stage 1B. I, 
think that is going to be um, challenging to answer at this stage with different informed consents in different countries. David, you may have more to add, more to, um, add to that than I. No, I think you framed it in the, in the right context, Julie, because for, for stage 1A, we're, we really want to see are there uh, existing cohorts to which we can uh, collate uh, the data. And so those cohorts will have already been informed. So um, for stage 1B, uh, again, the, the hope is we won't have to construct that entirely de novo. Um, so I think the same principles apply, not, not to mention the regional uh, differences in, in needs for the consent. So that would be a, that would be an issue that work project four or five that focuses on stage one B can can take into consideration. But there isn't a, a universal consent form contained within the call topic at this juncture. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Céline Caron who asks, when will the call be published and what will the deadline be? Um, very simply, we expect to publish it in the very near future. The deadline is usually around three months, but the details will be in all of the call documentation. So uh, that's a short answer to that one. Um, Ilya Art asks, would cross-sectional studies be considered in stage 1A? Yes. Okay. Yes, good. <laughs> a nice quick one there, thank you. Uh, Colin Palmer asks, is the availability of clinical biopsy reports sufficient for baseline ascertainment and or follow-up? Could, uh, could you read that through just a, uh, uh, once again? Sure. Um, is the availability of clinical biopsy reports sufficient for baseline ascertainment and or follow-up? Um, I'll answer that um, as best I can, and, and I think the answer is likely not. You know, we, we need these to be adjudicated, you know, by, by current uh, research-based criteria and, and not subject to the vagaries of uh, local, local pathology departments per se. I think that would be a difficult data set to harmonize, and it's such a... Um, critical denominator to the validation process that uh, if there are tissue blocks available that have not, you know, then that, that could meet the need because, you know, a work package uh, could contain adjudication of those under, under standard, you know, research protocols for adjudicating NAFL, uh, NASH stage on by histology. But the, the text of a, uh, a regional hospital clinical report is probably not of itself going to be sufficient. Julia, do you have a perspective on that? No, I, I would I would agree with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Andreas Geyer. Um, can other private partners join the industry partners? For example, companies merchandising other biomarkers or non-invasive invasive measurement devices. Can you read that question again? Sure. Um, can other private partners join the industry partners, for example, companies merchandising other biomarkers or non-invasive measurement devices? Hmm. Uh, Magda, do you have a perspective on that? From, from I'll try and address it from a scientific angle, but I, I don't know if there's an IMI perspective that you want to first voice. So, of course, other industry partners can join. Uh, in IMI2, uh, SMEs as well as medium-sized companies are eligible for funding, but uh, there are also possibilities for even bigger companies to join a, a applicant consortium and contribute. We've had this case, in fact, in the, the call seven. In some of the applications, there were some uh, technology companies joining on the applicant side, and this is possible. It just depends on the size of the company, whether they um, are eligible for funding, and uh, if not, then they would be contributing their own resources and participating at cost. So scientifically, I, I see no reason why not. I mean, we're, as, as Julia described, uh, we're, we're particularly interested in soluble biomarkers of 
that would be indicative of the level of fibrosis and or inflammation. And if there are some novel platforms, uh, proprietary platforms that uh, the applicant consortium feels that these are really uh, potentially very exciting and, and productive scientifically, there's no reason not, not to pursue that. And I, I would think by extension it, it would apply to imaging uh, as well. So if it were another pharmaceutical company that was an SP or pharmaceutical company that was looking to join and fund um, the program at this stage, I'm asking the IMI people, would that be a, a problem? Would it be permissible? But of course it wouldn't get um, the co-funding at this stage. It would not be a problem, but as you point out, uh, the matching uh, from IMI would not happen because that is set at the call text. Uh, I mean, call launch. Not call launch. Uh, when we uh, take the the topic to our uh, governing board for approval, so uh, this cannot be changed anymore. But if they participate, of course, uh, that could be added value. Okay. Okay. And the next question, um, do the subjects have to come from different countries, from Diana Garrido? I, I think because of the need for ethnic diversity, I would expect, yes, the answer to that question would be yes for lots of reasons, not, not just the ethnic diversity, but also the generalizability, et cetera, um, of, of the subject. Okay. Uh, Wim Yan Kolt asks, with respect to preclinical models, the strong focus seems to be on animals. Are in vitro 3D organ models considered viable alternatives? Yeah, that's an intriguing question. I mean, we didn't, we didn't um, consider that in depth in, in the discussions that, that led to the call topic. Um, I think a compelling argument would, would have to be made that that uh, a translatable recapitulation of in vivo conditions that contribute to NAFL and NASH can, can somehow be understood. Um, I, I doubt that would be the entirety of a preclinical model and organoid approach, but whether that would have a complementary role is something that an applicant consortium could could consider. But really, we were thinking more of traditional uh, animal models that contained uh, not only liver injury and, and progressive damage, but contained elements of the metabolic milieu that we know drives, believe drives the disease in humans. Okay. Another question from Wim Yan is, what is the expected cash budget? So the IMI uh, contribution to the to the applicants would be 15.8 million euro. And again, the details of the budget will be in the full text when it's published. Um, another question from Stefan Neubauer: Are clinical imaging biomarkers meant to also be part of stage 1A or only of stage 1B? Well, they could be in, in both components. You know, the, the stage 1A, what, what has been envisioned is that, that these will be existing data sets. And, and to the extent that uh, imaging has been done in that data set together with clinical information, liver biopsy, soluble biomarker work, um, all of that, uh, as well as standard clinical laboratory work, all of that would would seek to be leveraged in the work package that looks to harmonize and and uh, conduct bioinformatics on that. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, we expect to build um, stage 1B upon what we learn and validate with, with 1A. So for things to move into 1B, there must be some um, interrogation in respect to other biomarkers with 1A for it to move into 1B. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Detlef Schuppen. Will the preclinical models be exclusively used to validate the serum biomarkers or imaging biotechnologies, sorry, technologies with potential for patients? Will there be a therapeutic goal or is the aim to couple the biomarker to therapeutic intervention? 
so so I, I that, that, that's a good question. I, I think what we want to do is understand those animal models, which will most closely recapitulate the human the human situation and allow us to um, interrogate new drug candidates for efficacy and safety. I do think there is an element, as it's written right now, that those, those models, once they are identified as being the best and most appropriate model, may also be useful for mechanistic understanding of the disease process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christoph Kuchasik has a question. Would you consider to include in the project the discovery of voltaic organic components of potential NAFORD slash NASH biomarkers combined with a POC type dedicated analytical platform development? You're going to have to read that question for me. Again. <laughs> There's some long ones today. Um, would you consider including in the project the discovery of voltaic organic components as potential NAFORD slash NASH biomarker combined with a POC type dedicated analytical platform development? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. Uh, okay. I am going to try and forward these questions to both of you, so you should be able to see them in your um, panels. Uh, yeah. And in the meantime, um, I will move on to the next question. Otherwise, Christoph, if you can uh, clarify, that would be good. Well, there is yeah, one uh, very quick question. That. If we could get that rephrased, it might be helpful. Yeah. So while Catherine is uh, trying to send those questions over, there is one uh, quite easy question and I can answer from uh, Laurie. Uh, do you expect a single consortium to be selected? And yes, the answer is yes. In IMI, uh, in stage one, only one uh, consortium is selected to move on to the second stage where they merge with the uh, topic, uh, the pharma companies uh, participating into the topic. And the reason is precisely because we only have one, a pharma and uh, partners in research team, so only one full proposal can be prepared. And I would add, if you are unsure of IMI's procedures and the way our calls work, I really would urge you to uh, check out the webinar that we had yesterday. The recording is online along with the presentation. That really will explain how our calls work and it will help you. Uh, Christoph has raised his hand, so I'm just going to unmute him, then he can ask his question directly. Christoph, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Sorry for my uh, maybe too long question. Uh, I have, in fact, two questions. Uh, first is about the voltaic organic components as a potential biomarkers uh, to be used in the diagnosis of pro prognostic biomarkers. And uh, that requires the diagnostic platform, and we are developing the point of care analytical platform which could be used for measurements of these voltaic organic components. So, in fact, I have two questions. One is whether the voltaic organic components could be included as a potential biomarkers in this project. And second question, whether the platform development, uh, which could be used for point of care, voltaic organic components measurements, could be included in the project as well. Thank you. I hope it's a little bit more clear now. Um, I think it's a little clearer, so I, I'll, I'll try. I'll try and answer it, but but this may require follow up later on. I think really what what we're looking for here is is the best biomarkers to do the job of both diagnosis and, and prediction, and they need to be um, they need to be fit for purpose so that they could be used routinely in in a clinical development setting. So a lot of it is going to depend upon, upon how, how useful it's going to be in the long term. I think really what we're looking for is the best biomarkers. And when we say best biomarkers, we mean whatever it takes to be able to best diagnose and best predict who's going, who's going to progress. So personally, I don't have any strong feelings for the flavor of the biomarkers, just that, just that they do their job. Having said that, five years is not a very long time for platform development. So I would expect a platform to be pretty well in place at the start of the project, because this isn't about developing new platforms. It's more about things that are already along the way that we would completely have confidence that we're fully ready to go at the end, at the end of a five-year period. So, so that, that's my best answer to this question and the lack of, of all of the information right now. 
Thank you. Uh, Robert Ostendorf has a question regarding preclinical studies. What is IMI's view on the involvement of better predictive in vitro models to study specific mechanisms in NAFLD NASH development? So in, in vitro mechanisms. Um, I, I, I think that was that was not given in vitro mechanisms and, and development of assays for in vitro mechanisms say around very specific targets or nodes within pathway, this was not given a strong priority. And I, I, I think that it was really much more uh, in vivo models that were called out by the pharma partners as addressing uh, a, a gap. And so I would encourage applicants to focus more on in vivo rather than in vitro assays okay. within, the, within the realm of preclinical models. Thank you. Uh, Tim Montgomery asks, what are the data sharing expectations with the sponsoring pharma companies? So is, is that are the pharma companies sharing data? Are we asking a clinical trial data would be going in here? Or are we asking whether the investigators um, are, are required to share all of the data for, for the consortium? I think the, for, the, the second one, that, that seems to be the question. So, um, off the top of my head, the, the, uh, clearly we want to use all of the available data to be able to get to the best result at the, at the end of the day. So, so, I would expect that where it was allowable by the pharmaceutical companies, that we, we would share the biomaker data that we have. There are cost situations where, where that's not going to be allowable. But, but obviously it's in the best interest that all of the information that can be collated together goes into the pool. Okay, thank you. Um, Saskia van Mill asks, next to liver biopsies, uh, you expect that serum samples are available. Are microbiome-based biomarkers not of interest? As I already said, I don't think we care about the flavor of the biomarker other than it does its job. Okay, short and simple answer. Uh, David Wen has a question, which is more for Magda and I. Uh, if the call is released in May, can you try to avoid that the deadline will be in August, uh, when most of Europe is on vacation? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know what the deadline will be, but we are very aware of these issues, is all I will say. Um, and the deadline will be in the topic text when it's published. Um, Karine Roger asks, would you recommend a central reading of the liver biopsies in cohort, cohort 1B? Yes, if that has, hasn't, it, it, it's really going to pretend that uh, uh, it, it's going to uh, pertain to what's already been accomplished, the, the stage of maturity of the data in, in the stage 1A cohort. If, if all of it has already been centrally uh, read and adjudicated, there's no immediate need to replicate that process. Um, but if, if, and this pertains to maybe a question that was asked earlier, if it's been read uh, in a very dispersed way without a standardized uh, adjudication, then, then that would be a gap since we see that as a core central denominator that's driving the validation. So that would need to be identified um, in the application as a need for that cohort. Okay, thank you. P.T. Janssen asks, would pediatric NAFLD slash NASH fit in this call and would it be regarded as a separate cohort? So we have we have spoken about this, and, and clearly pediatric NAFLD and NASH are, are of interest and have big advantages in, in understanding the mechanisms. My perspective w would be that, as I've already said, it, it, it's a challenging enough space to already power this study to be able to get to where we need to be. Um, so, so my preference would be that it, it was largely adults that went into this study. Although I could see the value, I think it's really important to focus so we get to the answer that we need. Okay. We have another question from Ilya Arts. 
Could systems biology approaches generating biology-based biomarkers complement the statistics slash bioinformatics me methods? Yes, I think a concrete plan along those those, those lines would would be, uh, you know, could certainly be contained within an application, as as Julia has uh, outlined and emphasized several times. We want this to be very pragmatic and targeted and ideally hypothesis driven off pre-existing uh, data and insights rather than an omics, but to the extent that systems biology uh, resources can, can be brought to, brought to bear, that, that, that would be welcome. Okay. Thank you. We have come to the end of the questions for now, so if anybody else wants to ask something, I suggest you start typing fast. Um, as we've said a number of times, uh, the, all the information on the call will be available um, when we launch, and if I could give you one piece of advice, it would be to read that information. That is our number one piece of advice to applicants. It, there is quite a lot of documentation, we know that, but it really will help you to understand what's required of you, both in terms of our rules and procedures, and in terms of the um, topics themselves. And if you have any questions about the rules and procedures, ask us. Because again, we know that sometimes there are things that may not be clear. Um, and if you ask us, you're really giving yourself the best chance of making sure you've understood everything correctly. And that's really going to help you put together a good application. Um, so I don't see any more questions. So I think we can close for now. So I will say thank you very much to Julia and to Magda for their presentations and to David for being on hand and answering so many questions. Thank you to all of you for your interest in this topic and good luck with your applications. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everybody.